to write, so come on in. Hello and welcome to our online worship at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. This morning we are, are going to be continuing in our series focused on The Walk by Adam Hamilton, which is really a wonderful chance for us to go back to the basics in our faith and think through those practices that make us distinctive as Christians. I do want to remind everyone that we are not following the exact order of the chapters. So for next week, if you are reading along with us, please read chapter four on the topic of giving um, instead of chapter three. So again, we will do chapter four next week, followed by chapter three after that. Um, secondly, we have a final meet and greet. Um, as you may know, me, Julia Crone, and Pastor David Haley are the new associate pastors, and we are enjoying having the chance to get to meet with you and to know you better. So there's one final opportunity for those meet and greets, which will be this Monday um, from four to six, right here in the fellowship hall at church. We would love for you to sign up, um, and you can do that through your e-blast or by calling the church office. Finally, I want to let you all know that starting August 1st, we will be singing again in our in-person services. So if you are someone who has been waiting and watching online saying, when we start singing again, you will come and join us in person, now is the time. And for those of you who are not ready to come back to in-person worship, we are so grateful that you are here and joining us online today. Praise the Lord with the sound of trumpet. Praise, Praise the, the Lord, Lord with the harp and lute. Praise, Praise the Lord with the gentle sounding flute. Praise the Lord in the field and forest. Praise, Praise the, the Lord, Lord in the city square. Praise, Praise the Lord any time and anywhere. Praise the Lord with the crashing cymbal. Praise the Lord with the pipe and string. Praise the Lord with the joyful songs you sing. Praise the Lord on a weekday morning. Praise the Lord on a Sunday noon. Praise the Lord in the light of sun or moon. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you that you promise us that where two or three are gathered, you are there in the midst. Lord, we welcome you amongst us today and celebrate the gift of life that you have lavished upon each of us. We ask that you would open our ears so that we may hear your voice. Open our minds so that we may receive your wisdom. Open our spirits so that we may know your leading and guidance and open our hearts so that we can receive your wonderful love. We ask all this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Please join me in affirming our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, 
the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Psalm 34, verses 1 through 10. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Look to him and be radiant, so your faces shall never be ashamed. This poor soul cried and was heard by the Lord and was saved from every trouble. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you his holy ones, for those who fear him have no want. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of thy beauty see, wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty, teach me faith and beauty. One gives to all wonderful words of life, sinnerless to the love and call, wonderful words of life, all so freely given, wooing us to heaven. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Sweetly echo the gospel call. Wonderful words of life, all for pardon and peace to all. Wonderful words of life, Jesus only Savior, sanctify forever. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. 
life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. We come now to the time for our morning prayer. We have the great privilege of talking to God today through prayer. As we pray, I'm going to pause during the prayer and indicate when you can speak the names of those that you wish to lift up in prayer today. And you can either do that out loud or in your heart. So let us pray together. Lord God, Father of all mercies, we come before you today acknowledging that we are your unworthy servants and we give you thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all people. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may love one another just as Jesus loves us. We pray for comfort and healing for all those who suffer in body, mind, and spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles, and may they know the joy of your salvation. We especially pray for these whose names we bring before you right now as we name them in our hearts or out loud. Hear our prayers, O Lord. Lord, you have called us to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. We pray for those who do not yet believe and for those who have lost their faith, that they may receive the light of the gospel. Lord, to always show forth your love and grace through our lives. Help us, especially in these challenging times. We pray all these things in the strong name of Jesus. And now, as God's confident children, let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now let us reflect for a moment on our worship through giving. The psalmist said in Psalm 54, Behold, God is my helper. God is the upholder of my life. With a free will offering, I will sacrifice to you. I will give thanks to your name, O God, for it is good for you have delivered me from every trouble. Giving is an integral part of biblical worship. We give out of gratitude, as the psalmist said, for all which God has blessed us with. You can worship God through your giving by mailing a check in or by giving through our website or phone app. Let us pray. All things come from you, O oh God, and with gratitude we return to you what is yours. You gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Savior. All that we are and all that we have is a blessing from you. Living and loving God, accept all that we offer you as we worship you in giving. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen.
Now it's time for the children's message. So if you have children nearby who aren't already watching the video, now's a great time to call them over because I have something to share with them today. So, hey guys, I'm Pastor David, one of the associate pastors here at Wrightsville United Methodist along with Pastor Julia and Pastor Doug. And uh, I'm going to be sharing with you the children's message today. And I have something to show you. This is my puppet. And some people think this is a tomato, but it's actually an apple. And I have a story to tell you today about an apple. So in the story, a little four-year-old boy was visiting with his grandparents. And one day, his grandpa was sitting on the porch reading the newspaper and the boy walked in and he was carrying an apple and he handed it to his grandpa and he said something to his grandfather but his grandfather was older and, uh, and wore hearing aids like I do and he didn't quite hear what the boy said and he thought that grandma had sent him an apple a nice juicy apple to eat and so he took the apple and he took a bite, another bite, and pretty soon he had pretty much eaten the whole apple. And then he looked at his grandson and he noticed that it looked like he was about to cry. And he said, son, what's wrong? And his grandson said, well, granddaddy, I didn't want you to eat the apple. I just wanted you to get the worm out of the apple because sometimes an apple can have a worm in it. Now, Grandpa jumped to a conclusion, didn't he? He should have waited until he was sure what his grandson said before he started eating the apple, especially since there was a worm in it. Now this is an, an important life lesson for us. We have to be careful that we don't jump to conclusions, and especially when it comes to God. Sometimes people assume that God hates them or that God is mad at them. But when we read the Bible, we understand that God loves us. And that's why it's so important to come to church and to come to Sunday school and vacation Bible school and youth and children's activities and, and the Bible studies that might be offered. Because through all of these things, we learn about the Bible. We learn about what's really important to God. And we learn about God's love and forgiveness to us. And by the way, if you buy an apple in a store, it's not very likely to have a worm in it. <laughs> but now if, if you go pick an apple yourself uh, off a tree out in the woods or in an orchard somewhere, but you just might want to turn it around and make sure there's not a little hole in it somewhere where a worm crawled in. Apples and other fruits are God's gifts for us. They not only taste good, but they nourish us. They help us to grow healthy and strong. You know, there's even an old saying, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. That just means that eating fruit like an apple helps us to be healthy. So let's be careful not to jump to conclusions, especially about God. And let's thank God for apples to help keep us healthy. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for the children watching this video today. And we just pray that you will bless them and their families and help us to always remember how much you love us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hello and good morning. Welcome to Wrightsville United Methodist Church. Glad that you stopped by today. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Today we're in part two of our sermon series on the walk. And no, you don't have to have seen it last week in order to be a part of the sermon series this week. But we're following along with pastor and author Adam Hamilton's book series called The Walk, which gives us five unique and distinct practices for the Christian journey. And last week we learned about worship and prayer as one, um, I know that seems like two, but as, as the first step. And here in the second step, we're going to learn about the importance of reading the Bible. So let's pick up in the scriptures from Psalm 119, beginning in verse 97. Oh, how I love your law, says the psalmist. It is my meditation all day long. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is always with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your decrees are my meditation. Understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. I hold back my feet from every evil way in order to keep your word. I do not turn away from your ordinances, for you have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Almighty and everlasting God, once again, we thank you for your word, for the way that you reveal yourself to us through your word. And Lord, I pray that today we might understand why that's so important. So, Father, be with us today and help me as the word is proclaimed and as the word is heard and as we live out your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm going to start with a funny question. Have you done your last will and testament yet? Seems like a morbid way to start, I know, if you'll forgive me, but we all need to plan for the future. And one of the things we plan for is how we're going to distribute our estate, all our stuff, when we die. When you do your last will and testament, one of the things you will think about is what you will do with your most valuable possessions. What are those to you? Monetarily, it's probably your home and investments. But when you think about what's most valuable, maybe it might also include some other things like meaningful photos, a family heirloom, a special keepsake from your spouse or a friend, perhaps even special letters that you have written or someone has written to you. These things that you include in your will, your possessions, represent some of the things you consider most valuable in your life. Beyond your relationships, there are those things which hold the most importance, the most worth in all of your heart and soul. I want to talk to you today about something that's to be considered just as important, just as valuable. It is a treasure, a prized possession, an object of great worth. In fact, it is so valuable that its worth really can't even be calculated because the information contained in its pages don't just have earthly significance, but eternal significance. Of course, you know I'm talking about the Bible. A 2018 survey by the Barna Group concluded that 66% of Americans have some curiosity to know more about what the Bible says. Not just Christians, but 66% of all Americans. But the same survey showed that only 48% open up the Bible at least three to four times a year. Is that weird to you? 66% want to know more, but only 48% actually open up the Bible and try to read it. I'm trying to get my mind around that. One more time. Two-thirds say they want to know more about what the Bible says, but less than half actually try to read it. I can't figure that out, so I'm going to move on. In a sense, the Bible is a collection of letters. You might call them God's love letters to the world. It's the only book in the world that has God's direct revelation of who God is. It contains the key to eternal life. It gives us the divine standards of what is right and what is wrong. And 
It's where God speaks his very thoughts to us. To give you a 21st century analogy, the Bible is God's text message to you and to me. And even though it was written to all of us collectively, it's both personal and pertinent to us on an individual level. The Bible is God's primary way of speaking to you, speaking to me. So the problem I want to address today is if God is speaking, how many of us are trying to listen? As you look back at your life as a follower of Jesus Christ, from the first time that you ever stepped into a church until now, you've begun to learn certain habits that have helped shape your life. Last week we talked about two of them, worship and prayer. Today I want to add the third. This one is a habit that once you begin it, it will serve you with great insight, great wisdom as you continue to engage in it. The habit, of course, is reading your Bible as a daily discipline. Getting into God's Word every day will save you more heartache, give you more wisdom, protect you from more mistakes, infuse you with more comfort, and provide you with more encouragement than anything else you will do in your life. I've been blessed to know a lot of smart people, and I've read some pretty heady books but nothing and no one can come close to harboring all the wisdom, comfort, and inspiration that's in the Bible. I want to share with you today one verse of Scripture that, even though it's very brief, is loaded with tremendous practical reason for why you ought to read your Bible. But before I do that, I want to give you this illustration. If you've ever taken a particularly long trip to some place that you've never been before, you face two dangers. You know this. One is that you might end up taking the long way around. If you don't either talk to someone who's done that trip before, or put it in your GPS, or unfold it in a good old-fashioned map, you can add many miles and many hours to a trip that wouldn't necessarily have taken as much gas and as much time. The other mistake that you can make is to take the wrong way around. You can go north instead of going south. You can turn left instead of going right. And before you know it, you wind up many, many miles from where you thought you were going. Have you ever gone to a new place, a different city or a different area that you're not familiar with, and gotten all turned around because of bad directions? It still happens to me from time to time, and I bet it's happened to every one of you as it has happened to me. You're driving where you think you ought to be going. You're following the GPS. You're confident in your destination. But guess what? GPS didn't realize that there were two roads by the same exact name in the same town. And it just happens to be that those two roads are clear across town from one another. And before you know it, that voice comes on and says, arriving at your destination. And you look out your window and there's no building where your destination is supposed to be. You thought you were going the right way. But the reality is you should have turned left when you turned right. You should have gone south when you went north. And that GPS with all of its technology just didn't know the difference. You got bad advice, bad directions. And now you're late and you're frustrated. As you realize that because you took the wrong way around, you're now having to take the long way around. The truth of the matter is, there are many of us that have taken the long way around to where we should have gone throughout our lives. There are occasionally some really good stories and some really great adventures that have come out of these long side trips. Some well-earned experiences and lessons along the way. But more often than not, those life experiences that weren't on the straight and narrow are filled with stories of pain and regret. That's where this verse comes in from Psalm 119. The longest chapter in the whole Bible. It's found in the middle of the Bible in the book of Psalms. And when you read Psalm 119, it's interesting that the longest chapter is basically all about the Bible. This chapter tells us time after time after time the benefit of reading the scriptures the blessings of knowing the scriptures, and what happens to the person who both reads them and heeds them. 
The verse we're going to focus on today is from verse 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Or as Isabel Jewell just sang from the King James Version, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Keep in mind when the psalmist wrote these words, he was talking about writings that were already hundreds of years old. And yet the only verb in the entire verse is in the present tense. He doesn't say thy word was a lamp or was a light. He said thy word is a lamp is a light. Immediately, that tells us something about the Bible and why we need to read it. I want you to fill in the following blank, okay? You only need a lamp and a light if you are in the dark, right? Sure. Every one of us is born in spiritual darkness. We're in the dark when it comes to what is right and what is wrong. That's why you have to teach children the difference. We're in the dark about many of the big questions that we have to ask in our lives, like, should I marry this person or not? Should I take this job or not? Should I get involved in this activity or not? Should I move to this town or not? We worry because we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, when the truth is, we really don't even know what's going to happen in the next minute. We're in the dark. And when you're in the dark, the only thing that will help you is light. And that's where the Bible comes in. That's why every day you need to flip the switch. You need to turn on the lamp and you need to shine the light so you won't be walking in the darkness in any situation. Instead, you'll be walking in the light of what God says and what God wants for you. Now, before we can understand what the Bible is, we have to understand what the Bible does. That's why the psalmist gives us this metaphor of the Bible being a lamp and a light. Now, I used to wonder why use the words lamp and light Aren't they the same thing? Why, why use two different words? But then I realized that in biblical times, a lamp was used inside the house while a light was used outside the house. In other words, when you want to know where you are in the house, you turn on the lamp. If you're leaving the house and you want to know where to go, you want to make sure you're taking the right path. You want to make sure you don't stumble or fall. You use a light. Night light, flashlight, porch light. Using those two metaphors, let me show you what the Bible does and why it's important that you flip the switch on on a daily basis. Number one, the Bible tells us what to believe. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. Here's a physiological truth. Wherever your feet are, there you must be also. It is physiologically impossible to be somewhere where your feet are not. You cannot be downstairs while your feet are upstairs. You can't be outside when your feet are inside. A lamp doesn't only tell you where you are, but can also tell you whether or not you're standing in the right place. Are you standing in a good place or a bad place? Let me tell you why it's so important that we go to the Bible to tell us what to believe. There are two different ditches that the church can fall into when it gets away from following the scriptures. Jesus was talking to the disciples one time and he said, be careful. Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He actually says this statement twice in Matthew chapter 16. So it must be pretty important. What did he mean by the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? The yeast of the Pharisees is taking something too far. Okay, so much so that you miss the point of the law in the first place. Remember, these are the people who wore scripture verses tied around their foreheads. They're, they're the same ones who wouldn't go help someone who was lying in a ditch on the side of the road in the Good Samaritan story because the law said you can't touch someone who is dead. Better not take the chance of getting by somebody who might be dying on the side of the road because they might be dead. And then you'd be breaking the law. Now, really, what's worse? Not touching someone who is dead or not helping someone who might be dying. We still do this today, though. For instance, the church my father grew up in wouldn't allow people to play cards or women to wear pants. They had to wear dresses. I once got an earful from a visiting youth director when I was working at Camp Chestnut Ridge for giving a prayer outdoors without removing my hat. I understand. I was always taught that was a sign of respect, and I can promise you I have not made that mistake since that time. 
But I don't think God dismissed my prayer because I left my hat on while I prayed it. Sometimes we take the law so far, we miss the point. But Jesus also comments on the leaven of the Sadducees. That represents the people who don't take the law seriously enough. For instance, the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection, and that's why they were sad, you see. Oh, gosh, it's so bad. Bad joke. If you refuse to use the Bible as the most important guide in your life, what are you using as a guide in your life? I read a true story that was told by an orthopedic surgeon in Miami who, while he was in medical school, had a teacher whose lectures constantly contradicted the textbook. After one particular class, he walked up to the professor and he said, I've been reading my text and I've been listening to your lectures and there are various points in which your lectures disagree with the textbook assigned for the class. The professor said, really? Bring me your book. Show me where there's disagreement. So the student went and got the book and brought back and showed him several pages on where there was this contradiction and then that contradiction. And the professor said, write down those page numbers for me. And the student did. And then with that as a guide, the professor calmly yet purposely ripped those pages right out of the book, wadded them up, threw them in the trash can, handed the book back to the student and said, there, now it agrees with me. We still have page rippers here in the church, in every church. And we use the page rippers when it comes to what the Bible really says. One is, we've never done it that way before. And the other one is, we've always done it this way. It doesn't matter what the Bible says. It doesn't matter if it's God inspired. If we've never done it that way before, then we just want to rip it out. And if we've always done it that way, we rip out anything that might contradict us. We would save ourselves a whole lot of heartache a whole lot of needless, pointless arguments full of high blood pressure moments if we would simply let the Bible speak to us as a whole. Let it be a lamp to guide us in what we believe. Number two, the Bible also tells us how to behave. The scripture goes on to say, and a light unto my path. Again, every word here is important. The feet from the first section refer to where you are. That's what you believe. The path refers to where you're going. And that refers to how you behave. Psalm 37 says, The Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. God is interested in every step you take on a daily basis. He's interested in every path you decide to go down. The way he guides you to take the right path and do the right thing is through his word. One of my favorite uh, scriptures is, comes in this proverb from Proverbs 2.20. It says, thus you will walk in the ways of the good and keep to the paths of the righteous. How do you find the ways of the good? How do you know the path of the righteous? Through God's word. It's in the Bible where God guides our steps and make sure we stay in the way of goodness and on the path of righteousness. If you allow God to direct your steps, if you'll flip the switch on and turn on that lamp so you know what to believe and turn on the light so you know how to behave, then you'll know where you are and you'll know where you're going. You'll be a lot less likely to take the wrong or long way around. So I'm feeling confident today that most of you are in that 66% of Americans who are curious about what the Bible says. So let's open it up together. Like last week, I want to close today's message with an invitation or an assignment. Last week, I asked you to attend worship either in person or online 90% of the time between now and the end of the year, and also to pray five times a day. Today, I want to ask you, of course, to read your Bibles. This time, though, you can choose the pace you want to go. You can either read five verses a day or, if you're more experienced, five chapters a week. Either five verses a day 
or five chapters a week. Now, don't just read it. I want you to think about it. Okay? I want you to ask yourself, what do these verses tell me about God? What do these verses tell me about people? What do these verses say to me and God's will for me? Let's begin at the same place. Let's start with the Gospels. Beginning in Matthew, chapter 1, I want you to skim through the genealogy in verses 1 through 17, and then we'll all pick up in verse 18 and read at least five verses today, okay? Or five chapters this week. As Pastor Adam Hamilton said at the end of this week's chapter, do this, and I promise you will hear God speaking to you. You'll grow deeper in your faith, and you'll find yourself in a closer walk with God as you follow God's lead. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Pray with me. Gracious God, we are grateful for the words of the Bible. For all 66 books, for all the many pages from Genesis to Revelation that reveal so much of who you are and your will for us. Holy God, help us in our curiosity to know you, to get into your book, to learn more about who you are, to learn more about ourselves, and to learn more about the path that you would have us go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
All right, as we get started this week, let's feed that curiosity. Let's open up our Bibles. And by the way, if you don't have a Bible, swing by the church, call me, do something. We will get you a Bible, okay? Be happy to get you a Bible. But if, um, if you've already got one at home, then let's go ahead and start with Matthew in the New Testament, one of the Gospels, okay? And we're going to pick up there in chapter 1. Remember, either five verses today, each day, or five chapters per week. And we're going to learn more about who God is, how God relates to us, and God's will for our lives. Five verses a day or five chapters a week. Let's get into the Word. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. May the Lord rise to meet you. May the 